so this is the guaranteed way to get into anybody's network, no matter how well it's secured, how well it's patched, all that sort of thing. I can tell you this works today. It, the, the bad guys are out there using this successfully in every environment that I'm aware of. And what they do is they send a nice looking email like this, uh, sent to me. That's my two year old daughter. She's nice and cute. So of course, I want to click on that link and find out what, what more pictures are there. So the problem is I click on it and a slew of different ways happen to get access to my computer. And in fact, right before I walked up here, I saw that Adobe announced they patched for Flash to today to fix a critical vulnerability. Uh, so unless you've patched Flash in the last, uh, you know, 24, 48 hours, uh, surfing right now with your web browser is uh, putting your computer at risk. Because Flash is prevalent on just about every interesting website you go to. Um, but of course there's lots of ways to do that and really those things just open the door and, uh, and the bad guy walks into your computer. So the next thing that happens is uh, if there's administrative access available through various means, either because the user has it, which, and I tried to find a statistic that showed how common that is out there. Nobody's actually done a survey on that. But my guess is it's at least in one in 10. I'm aware of at least one Fortune 50 company that it's 100% of every employee has administrative privileges on their computer. Uh, so we're talking about you know 150,000 employees, one company, every one of them has privileged access. Uh, if I have privileged access, and there's of course ways to get privileged access from normal user access too, especially if you've missed a Microsoft patch along the way. If I have that, I can dump these hashes here, and these are just the password hashes, and you know, here's my hash, and you know, maybe the administrator logged in recently. So his hash is uh, cached on the computer as well. And you're thinking, oh, I'm a Unix guy, I know about password hashes, yeah, that kind of sucks. They could probably brute force the password. Well, that doesn't apply in the Microsoft world. Password hashes are first class citizens in the password world. That means that I don't have to have the password to log in someplace. I just have to have the hash of the password to log in someplace. So, in fact, you'd question why did they even bother to hash the password? They, what was the point? And I don't know, that's lost in the 1990s somewhere with Windows 95, I think. But with these hashes and, and magically this administrator hash that was uh, left on my computer when the administrator did something to my computer, uh, I can now, as a bad guy, zip through the entire network with that hash and, and log in from computer to computer across the network. And of course, that gives me complete domination of an environment rather quickly if I'm a bad guy. So to sum it up, what we have is the bad guy, you know, they do their phishing email. And what happens is they laterally move across our network, uh, whatever the environment is, and eventually they get to uh, central resources and own the environment. And we've done a study here looking at uh, networks. By the way, this is not unrealistic. Pretty much from any random place in the network where they gain a foothold to the central systems is usually never more than four hops away. So it's, it's really quite close. Uh, so it doesn't take very long to get there. All right, so let's talk about uh, what that means in terms of how we go about dealing with these issues. So I'm gonna go through, first talk about what we deal with in terms of data to, to find, attack, mitigate these issues, and then talk about some of the solution space that, that we're leveraging, especially on the high performance computing side. So earlier I heard uh, the talk about big data, and this is what big data means to us in the cyber world. Um, you know, I think if you look at these numbers here, I, I would hope that everybody kind of says, yeah, those seem reasonable, you know, 45 emails, probably a fair number of you get a lot more than those in a day. Um, but you know, this includes maybe some technicians, some people that don't, don't necessarily do a lot of email work, uh, thanks to things like uh, HTML email these days and, and all the attachments we have, you know, the, the average size of email is getting bigger. Uh, we generate a lot of network flow sessions. There's a lot of internal traffic now. It's, it's getting close to a gig a day for every desktop computer. Uh, uh, I see that likely crossing the gig mark in the next year or two. 
And, and you know, slowly the, the external traffic's going up as well. And of course, we're logging more and more stuff on the host, on our central servers about whatever user does. So we take all that stuff and for a 10,000 person organization, which is, you know, a, a modern size organization, there's plenty of those that are bigger, um, you know, one and a half billion records a day, approximately, getting close to 10 terabytes a day. In fact, we collect at LANL, because we have a little more than 10,000 people, we collect about 10 terabytes of data uh, every day just for our cyber purposes, for our cyber defense purposes. And uh, when we figure that out, that, that turns into close to, sorry, that's 10 terabytes, turns into about six gigabytes a, si uh, a minute that we have to collect in a streaming fashion. So, you know, I'm sure in some problems, we talk about Walmart or something like that, that's small, but uh, given cybersecurity budgets, that's a large number. And we talk about the traditional serial approach, you know, we have one appliance that we want to do all this stuff on. Uh, you know, there's not too many hard disks out there that'll stream that, or even RAID arrays that'll suck that in in any s substantial way. So, it really does turn into a high performance computing problem in a certain sense. Uh, when we look at the traditional environment out there, uh, got, you know, the Oracles and the DB2s, you know, that's the sort of size space they like to talk about. Uh, obviously, we go back to what we're seeing in it today. That's not too many days of data. Uh, we also have, of course, the MapReduce environment out there. Greenplum, the Tiza, Hadoop, which we talked about, I heard earlier today. Uh, you know, and, and these are sort of the numbers we see. You know, eBay is in the, and it's probably a little bigger now, you know, 10 petabyte range. Facebook is generating about 10 terabytes a day, and they use a Hudu uh, environment. And of course, one of the problems we have, you know, so the, the great thing is, of course, is partitioned and is stored across lots of nodes. Good thing. One of the things we're dealing with is this idea of, you know, or we just have a static data set and that we're querying against, or, you know, and I go back to the point is we have this continuous ingest of data that we're dealing with, and it's sort of it's a streaming data problem that we have to deal with. And hopefully this graph will demonstrate what we, the problem we at least see in the streaming data set. And it, and it comes down to when we put it into a traditional database, it, inserts are expensive because we want to index that stuff. It's great because down here in the corner, we get really fast lookups. So if we can index it in any sort of successful way, uh, then of course querying is really handy. The problem here is, is that if we spend all our time up here in this indexing, we either get behind and lose data on the ingest, which we see traditional databases very good at, uh, you know, losing data, uh, especially when we have a real-time feed. And the other issue we see is we'll, we'll optimize, we'll say, well, we got it working, it's collecting all the data. And two things happen. One is next week, somebody does a big file transfer and kills the database uh, because we collected too much data on that. Or we have an incident actually occur and 10 analysts attempt to query the database all at the same time. So now this little line bumps way up here because it's a factor of 10 bigger. And of course, now ingest fails again because we can't index and query at the same time. So in a perfect world, we would love to see this. Uh, this is my little graphic. We have lots of data out here. It's all different, all those different sources. Uh, it's, it's a mess. We don't necessarily have a way to compare IP addresses to IP addresses in different data sets or what's a user, how does that map to an IP address, all those sorts of things get hard. We want to put that in a big, big high performance computing environment and we want two things to come out of it. One, the cyber analysts can do all the things that they want to do as fast as they can do it. Uh, in fact, I go back to that original problem statement I had there. Uh, that phishing email, if we can detect that, if an analyst can analyze that it came in, maybe a user called and said, hey, I got a suspicious email. If they can find all the other 25 IP addresses in their network that also received that email in maybe less than 10 minutes, uh, an incident can go from you know a multi-million dollar problem to a non-issue. And that all comes down to essentially how fast can they query that data. Uh, so timing really does matter here. Uh, and of course, so we want them to be able to do magic stuff and, and, and iterate on it as much as possible and enter queries that maybe didn't have good indexing on it to start with. That's the other problem we see with some of these indexing systems is, well, we indexed on IP address, but we didn't index on source port and source port's what the analyst cares about today for whatever reason or, or whatever it is. So now all of a sudden they're searching the database that's indexed 
and they really bring it to its knees because they're searching on a field that's not indexed. And of course, the other piece is that we want to have a research community who actually has access to real data and live data to evaluate new ideas and new techniques and not have to, I don't know, speculate about what a good thing is for cybersecurity. Because uh, if you look at like academic research, for example, there's a lot of speculation of what the problem space really is. All right, so along this line, and this is uh, Los Alamos's approach to file, uh, to MapReduce, call it FileMap. Uh, we've tried Hadoop, uh, as I was explaining earlier, somebody, uh, Java, not a friendly environment to your standard cybersecurity analyst. Uh, they don't want to deal with Java. They want to deal with shell scripts, command lines, web pages, maybe their junior analysts. They want to maybe use Python. C is not an unfamiliar environment for uh, your standard analyst because they come from a system OS background probably. Uh, Java, and, and I put myself in this position, I don't want to deal with Java. So Hadoop's bad from that standpoint. The other thing is Hadoop has a lot of overhead and expectations of how the data is formatted. Uh, the tuple concept is not necessarily very conducive to how we want to deal with stuff in the cyber environment. So we've developed this thing called FileMap. The assumption is, is we leave all of the data in its native format. We don't necessarily do a lot of pre-processing of the data. We spray it out across a set of uh, a cluster and, and environment. And then we actually allow native tools to be used, mapped out to do searches, and then reduce functions across that to provide data back in a summarized format to the analyst. So we found good, good success with this. I will tell you it's not the end all be all of uh, MapReduce for the cyber environments and, and we're still looking for the good solution that's out there. So Hadoop, not it. Uh, this stopgap measure, still looking for the right answer. Uh, and just so you can see what, you know, we, we've done some benchmarks here and we find that our, our solution works pretty good. Uh, you know, 10 billion records in six and a half minutes, still not real great. Uh, of course, the point here is, is this is non-indexed data. We're leaving it in its, in its original raw form and, and doing just raw searches over it, but in parallel, and then reducing that back as a, as a function for the analyst. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is uh, malware analysis. So again, sort of a uh, highly parallel, embarrassingly parallel problem. Um, we have lots of malware. We have a collection that's uh, 3.7 million uh, different samples of malware. We want to understand them all and how they interact with each other. Uh, we want to understand how when we get a brand new piece as a part of those spear, spear phishing emails, how does it relate to all the other ones here? Uh, you know, can we attribute it back? And when we talk about attribution in cybersecurity, it's less about who is the individual that did it, but who in terms of the techniques that we see from historical data to the new thing, how do those compare? Can we use defenses that we've already developed, all those sorts of things? That's actually what we care most in attribution. So, you know, building that sort of thing. The problem is, is that malware has these software protections built in. They do a lot of uh, packing, coding, encrypting of their own data so that you can't just take the static executable and do analysis on it. So what we have to do is run them in an actual OS environment like they're intended to be uh, and collect data there. So what we have is a whole bunch of VMs you know, running across lots of different systems, uh, paying lots of money to Microsoft for lots of Windows licenses, and, uh, and then running a modified Zen kernel we developed with Virginia Tech to build instruction traces out of all of that data. What that gives us is these, uh, these fancy instruction traces. The neat thing is we can visualize them, which actually is one of the quick wins we get see out of this process. Um, it's the first time I actually have seen cybersecurity visualization do something other than operational awareness. We can actually bring these into a visualization tool and, and you can see structure here. You can see things like this red part here is the actual packing code. Uh, we can label that. You can see where the actual original code starts to run. Uh, down here, you can see all this sort of packing. There's maybe a knot. Hopefully, you can see down here. That's uh, those knots actually end up being the command and control loops. And these things are the case statement 
of, you know, when you get this command, do this sort of action. If you get this command, do this sort of action. So visually identifying those things and then moving into the reverse engineered part of that code quickly and easily through a visualization tool provides great value. Of course, the other thing we're doing is building graphs and, and, and understanding substructure here, making comparisons to that. Uh, more, more recently, as part of a uh, research project, we're bringing in some phylogenetic capabilities out of uh, HIV research and other things that do fuzzy matching on genetic uh, codes to do that sort of thing over these instruction sub-elements here. Uh, so, so, so that's the malware piece. Now we talk about, okay, bad guys in, we know they've done some malware, now can we detect them moving through this network, those lateral movements from host to host to host to get to some key thing that they're after. And the way that works is, you can see this little, what we do is we, we build a, a graph out of that and we look for these things where, you know, they move from here's where they got the spear phishing email, they move to this host, to this host, and then this host. So can we detect, you know, and then there's of course other hosts involved, but can we detect that lateral event there? And the answer is yes we can, but it is computationally quite expensive. High performance computing provides a great environment to solve this in relatively quick times. So if we just look at our own network, we have 20,000 computers approximately in our unclassified network at Los Alamos. So we have a, a 20,000 node network. Um, but when we look at, you know, in a 30 minute period, uh, those 20,000 nodes are talking to, you know, in each other in different ways, 90,000 different ways. Uh, so we build that out and if we enumerate three paths, a node talking to a node, talking to another node or a computer instead of node, um, that turns into 300 million of those. So the point is, is that it gets exponentially large in terms of you know, exploring all these paths. So we call that path enumeration. We build a library to do that. Uh, it is an MPI library. You know, it, um, you know, in terms of order of, uh, of complexity, you know, expands out exponentially. Um, but it's a great MPI problem. Yeah, we can parallelize it because like a lot of graph problems that are MP complete or MP hard, uh, just enumerating edges is something we can do in parallel. So we do that um, and we get some pretty decent results out of that. And, and the reason we talk about 30 trillion uh, three paths are either we're looking at historical data and trying to understand over time how these things occur, not just in a 30 minute window, or we're looking at networks larger than like Los Alamos's. And this pretty picture that hopefully sort of shows up uh, gives us an example how we can look for these events that occur. And actually what we really do here, just to explain this slightly more deeply, is we build a base model of what we think the network should do based on historical traffic and look for changes over that from a new time period, maybe right now that we're looking at. So, and those comparisons are really what we see in terms of anomalous events. And so this is actually real data actually from Los Alamos' network where we see an anomalous uh, traversal occurring uh, across lots of things. So, um, and, and the reality is this is a, a real incident here. So uh, that happened back in 2007. So, uh, so we've justified that this actually is a very valid way of finding those traversals that we don't expect because it's actually not common for a user to log into a computer, log into another computer, go from that computer to yet another computer, and, and finally end up in some other place. That just doesn't happen as part of a normal behavior. Uh, but finding it is computationally expensive. All right, so, so that sort of sums up that piece. Um, also on the modeling side, um, and this is, while this piece here is mature, I would say this is something we're, we're growing more into is how can we use the modern simulation environment, uh, especially of discrete time simulations to, to understand in the cybersecurity world, and this will be heresy I think to some people, but understand how much benefit do we get out of a solution versus how much is it gonna cost us. And so this is looking at sort of a traditional worm environment, understanding from a patching point of view, how much patching do we need to, you know, how much perva pervasive patching do we need to ensure occurs versus how much are we willing to risk in terms of 
degradation in a network and and recovery from that degradation. So uh, so the idea is, is you know, and, and here's one percent. If we have you know only one percent not patched, you know, it's just a little dip in, in traffic versus you know where you start to get five, ten. You know, and the point is is it actually you know it's a huge difference from one to five percent. But once you get down here, it doesn't start to change that much. So you know, having 20% of your systems unpatched versus 10% really isn't actually going to change your dynamic that much in terms of how much your, your performance, in this case network, are, are impacted. So we're really starting to see how we can leverage this in, in lots of solution spaces. You know, can we build a model of an environment, deploy a solution in that simulation and model, simulate it, and look at what the benefit is and then decide is the cost of that worthwhile for that benefit. Uh, so good application of high performance computing. Um, the last thing here is on uh, again the simulation is understanding these large botnets out there, building a discrete model of those things, down in fact to the level of the actual protocol they're using. This is uh, the Kademula peer-to-peer -peer environment. We actually build that Kademula peer-to-peer, -peer, the, the distributed hash table associated with that across all the nodes, build it at, actually down at that level uh, as part of it, and this is actually an MPI-based code also called SimCore that this uses, build that actually as part of the simulation and then allow us to really understand how these botnets work and interestingly understand them how they work in terms of different geographic distribution because of different uh, you know, connections and, and how the internet works, you know, different bandwidth of how different parts of the world are connected in terms of geography, uh, how things like time zones affect this, you know, the fact that lots of people turn their computers off at night turn it back on during the day, how does that affect the dynamics of these large scale botnets? So, all right, that's the end. Usually there's lots of questions, so I will take questions on this stuff. The calling in? Yeah. My, while I wouldn't preclude that it's possible, and in fact, I would say actually, I haven't seen it in the lab environment per se. I've actually gotten a couple personally. Now with the voice over IP stuff, it's so easy to originate from anywhere in the world with any caller ID source that you want uh, with a stolen credit card with some of these voice over IP providers. Um, that's not uncommon, you know. And so you hear the, the, the computer voice uh, generated thing, you know, please, press one now so that you can uh, update your credit card information or something like that. Um, so I'm not aware of specific things against, you know, targeted things, partially because even you can do that and what it takes a stolen credit card conceivably in an account with a VoIP provider. Um, spear phishing emails are a free thing, right? I mean, it's, we've done, you know, and, and some of the other national laboratories and some other sites around do, you know, sort of spear phishing email awareness thing, so we send our own spear phishing emails. It, it takes 60 minutes maybe tops to set one of those up. And most of that's brainstorming a really good idea uh, and attempting to make sure that you don't tick off your HR department or some other, you know, that you didn't do the, you know, retirement benefits thing or some other training thing that then nobody ever wants to, you know, the, the favorite one is uh, we did the HASPD-12 badge thing, well, that got the HSPD-12 real badge people really upset. Uh, so, you know, trying to navigate that, but it's so easy. Uh, and, and so we see these just in, in, in mass quantities. And frankly, I'll say it's so easy to make them very personal. Uh, and go back to my example, you know, it's a picture of my daughter. Uh, conceivably, with a little bit of work on Facebook, uh, just because my Facebook account is pretty closed up doesn't mean that somebody who, you know, was at the birthday party that that picture was taken didn't also take a picture of my daughter and tag it as my daughter, you know, associated with me or my wife or whatever. That it's not that hard to do a little research, get something that's very personal to somebody and convince them that this is a personal email and that there's no way it could be a spear phishing thing. Uh, that, you know, and that, that's maybe 30 minutes of effort uh, to do that. And we see that occurring. We see, you know, conferences and other things being, being leveraged and taken advantage of. And, and at least from my point of view, there's no good reason why uh, 
we should expect a user to be able to differentiate between one of these really good spear phishing emails and not. That's why I'm a strong proponent. It's not just, you know, fixing these problems is not about fixing our users. Fixing these problems is about finding better ways to, you know, harden our networks, defend them, apply things like high performance computing to the problem space, detect them as quickly as we can, mitigate them as quickly as we can. Uh, so.